coming back um, into open session from a closed session. Um, we will first have our um, uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Mr. Parati, uh, Ruben, would you lead us, please? Wonderful. I think it should be a family thing. Absolutely. Please stand. Please stand. Put your hand. Put your hand over your heart. Join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Very well done. Very well done. Yes, I know. <laughs> Babies do grow. Uh, coming back from closed session, during that time, we discussed public employment um, in terms of contracts um, and uh, the superintendent's evaluation we did not get to. So we only had the uh, one item that we talked about. We will be going back to that and the um, Expulsions will be after the regular meeting and another closed session. I'd like to have approval of the agenda. Would someone like to move approval of the agenda? I move approval of the agenda. Mr. Thomas moves. Second. Mr. Menziger seconds. Uh, vote, please. Question. Yes. Um, since we didn't get a chance to do the expulsions, um, if it looks like the meeting is running long, would you object to maybe breaking in the middle, or you guys would just want to wait to the end and do the expulsions and come back? Take 15 minutes, do the expulsions? Because, um, Mr. Wynn, are you okay with? I'm driving, Mr. Irwin. Oh, oh okay. 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 Very good. Then, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rodriguez. Then I'm fine. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. Okay, vote, please. The vote is five to zero. Uh, Dr. Markin, do you have some announcements for us? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not till you vote on the PAL. Okay. Very good. Uh, staff reports? While Ms. Nielsen is um, setting up on the staff report, I, I would like to just uh, again thank the board for the last three weeks and your unbelievable involvement in everything going on in Newark Unified between the um, drama productions and the musicals and the promotions and the graduations and the on and on and on. It was um, an exhausting several weeks and virtually all of you were at virtually everything and uh, I want to thank you for that that you've uh, you represent uh, the community extremely well and appreciate the time and effort um, into that because it is untold hours so thank you you were there too so so we thank staff. You. Yeah. Thanks to all. Good evening. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to present the budget for adoption tonight. And again, this is just the education code that states that we have to um, adopt a budget on or before July 1st of each year. Again, I'm showing you the enrollment and what we are doing on the average daily attendance. We are on the average daily attendance. We are staying over 96% uh, for the last few years, and this will uh, hopefully continue. Our enrollment is starting to stabilize. Uh, I can I see a decrease in next year of a, only about 27 students. So uh, that's a good projection uh, with the next year saying approximately the same. So our enrollment is stabilizing. 
some of the revenue assumptions we're using is the cost of living at 1.565% with a revenue limit deficit of 18.997. The uh, attendance ADA that we're using is the prior period from 2012-13 actual period to attendance, which at, was as of, I believe, March 27th of 6,241. The categorical uh, programs have been reduced 6%, and there's no carryover uh, projected in this budget. That will be budgeted when we do the first interim. The categorical funds for the state is flat funding at this point with flexibility provisions extended through the 14-15 year. And funding for uh, the lottery, both the restricted and unrestricted side, are up for a total of $154. That's the highest I've seen in probably 10 years. Here's a projection in thousands of the preliminary budget. The revenue and the interfund transfers in. Uh, both for what we're estimating for 1213 and then what is going to be in the budget. This is approximately what you saw two weeks ago when we had the workshop. There's very little change in what's being presented. Here you can see the source of the revenue that we're doing here, where you can see the majority of our money is coming from what we call the revenue limit. And that's the um, combination of property taxes and the money that is sent from the state. And then if you add with that the other state revenue at an additional 18%, you can see we are heavily dependent upon the state for our funding. Uh, with federal revenues at 5%, well, actually, lottery also is included as a state. So that's 20, yeah, uh, quite a bit. <laughs> with local revenue at just 7%, and the majority of that local revenue is the money coming through for our special education through this, our SELPA with the transfers in. Uh, the class size reduction, you can see that it's the same per purple that we had this time. Also with the 30% penalty, because we are using the ratio of 26 to 1. So the 30% penalty applies. The interest income is projected at a 0.25% which is a little bit down from what I presented two weeks ago, uh, only because we got the correct interest for last month or last quarter, which was a 0.21%. It's just interest is not giving us any money. <laughs> we are going to apply for the mandated cost block grant, which is $47 per ADA, and I'm estimating that to be about 290000 The special education revenue is budgeted very conservatively. We did have the revenue from the SELPA they projected, and I have used that projection in uh, doing the revenue assumptions. The flexibility provisions are all projected through this um, with you approved the resolution for the flexibility transfers at the last meeting. I'm, the interfund transfers in from the special reserve are still at 1,250,000. You can see on our revenue limit, the top blue line is what we should have gotten, and the bottom red line is what we actually have received on that. And it is, that is projected through the 15-16, so it's going through the additional years that we have. The expenditure assumptions, certificated and classified salaries and benefits, the step and column 
I've been fully budgeted. There's an increase of 4.1 FTE for certificated. Um, the health benefit increase is are budgeted at the current cost. The cost of 1% is 412,768 with the breakout for the teacher CSEA and NUMA as shown. Again, here's an explanation. You can see certificated salaries, classified salaries and benefits are approximately 85% of our budget. I'm going quickly. You can see the staffing percentages that we have on certificated, classified, and management. Some of the other expenditure assumptions that we're using, K3, we've gone from 27 to 1 to 26 to 1 to be able to take advantage of the LCFF uh, requirements. There's no contribution projected to be transferred to the deferred maintenance at this time. The indirect at last year, or this current year, 12-13, is 6.96. And you can see that we've decreased that indirect to a 5.16. The interfund transfers out is the $100,000 to uh, the adult fund. The multi-year projection, you can see that we are deficit spending. This, is, this budget was created using the current law, which is the revenue limit and how we budgeted for the last 30 years. So you can see where this would be a problem projected for the third year. But we have the LCFF that was passed by the state last Thursday or Friday and Saturday. And so if we look at a different multi-year projection using the local control funding, you can see that we will um, not have a deficit uh, and we will be able to get through the third year out. Still there. So that's very good, and this is with a conservative budget of the local control funding because there still is a lot of unknowns for us. And so what we will do, we're, I'm asking for the budget to be passed as it is presented using the old formula, and we will have 45 days to redo this budget using the um, local control funding model. So um, this picture could change because I only did a conservative budget on the out years. These are the special reserve funds that we went over a month ago, I guess now. They have uh, not been changed, um, you know, maybe a thousand dollars or two, but uh, most of them have not been changed. These are the capital projects. The Fund 21 is the Measure G fund that we're working on. And only the, uh, it's been budgeted, excuse me, very conservatively. The debt service and the self-insurance funds are, there was no change to any of that than what we had uh, presented prior. Future impact, we've had the May re revision and the governor largely maintained his position on the local control funding formula. And he did increase the accountability requirements. What we have had previously to the LCFF is that most of the accountability was based on the budget or, and exactly how we expended money. That is now changing. I hope we have some more, um, we should have some more information on that over the next uh, couple of months 
so that we know what the actual requirements are and that I could redesign our accounting system to uh, be able to account for that easily. Uh, we have, um, they've also approved Common Core um, augmentation, which will receive $170 per ADA, which will give us an additional $1 million to be able to do uh, the common core that we need to do over the next two years. The state budget passed both houses of the legislation on Friday. All the trailer bills also passed by both houses on Saturday. As of now, we, the governor has or has not signed it? He's not signed it yet, so it's not in law yet. Um, I did put down that we're going to workshops on July 7th. I, that's a wrong date. We're going on the 9th and 16th. And we will be doing a budget, budget revision according to the 45 days requirement for the new funding model. So do I have any questions? I know I went kind of quickly. Oh, um, I guess Mr. Menziger. Okay, um, just very quickly. Um, Sorry, Nancy. The, when we look at the ending fund balances, or we, we look at... What okay. page are you on? Well, I'm looking at page four. To start four? four? Okay. Yes. Now, I understand that uh, um, Yeah, you can just scroll down from there. Zero, one, two, three, four. Yeah. I'm double clicking on my monitor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. No, I'm looking at. Right. There you go. Okay. Okay. Um, Sorry, we're looking at we're looking at uh, um, uh, a deficit deficit spend, and then and then when we're talking about uh, about four hundred twelve thousand uh, dollars. As one percent of employees um, of the compensation. So, if we were to, you know, with two contracts and management, who we're all considering, we have to consider over the next year or so. Uh, a five percent, even if we did a, a five percent raise, would be about another two uh, two million. Even a three percent would be a one point two, and that's not con that's not considered or that one point two million. Either one, of, you're not considering any increases in in. So you're so what you're considering is whatever uh, the salary basis is today plus step in columns. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, so with the LCF with the local control funding formula, um, that uh, I saw you you know you, you made an attempt, which is amazing considering you have no assumptions or very few assumptions to make or to use in 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 budgeting. Um, so you, in the next 45 days, you're going to actually redo that again okay correct so what you're asking us this evening is to prove this budget that we have here um, not considering the uh, uh, the local control uh, funding formula but the standard way and then when we go into the first interim sometime there you'll revise and that's what will actually the um Ed code requires a four. I have to revise it within 45 days of it being signed. So I will be bringing this back to you in August. It's just insane. It's just insane. Okay. Um, that I think I think that's it. Uh, you, okay. You've we've seen all this material for the past month and a half, so there's yeah. no shockers in here. So. Yeah. Ms. Thomas. Okay. I'm noticing even with the local control funding formula, uh, we're deficit spending every year we still will be uh, especially next year and probably the following year but after that if what I'm hearing is correct uh, I imagine that the third year out we should be close to an even budget um, and then my question really was about the one Yeah. Um, the the one million 
over two years for um, the implementation of Common Core? Correct. Um, uh, that's not included in here because it wasn't law when right. this was but being done. Right, but assuming we're going to spend that on Common Core for things like materials and, and professional development, uh, th do, we have to, do we have to spend it in the two years or can we stretch it out? I, I don't know, uh, know that answer. I do know from what I've been at workshops, they say you have to spend it over two years. But they didn't say if that's 24 calendar months. So say we receive, we're supposed to receive the money in September of October. Will that go, you know, till October? Oh, two so we years could be doing now. summer work with teachers in Correct. that last summer and everything. Okay, Correct. thanks. That was my question, Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mrs. Nielsen. Um, the um, the governor, once he signs the budget, then within 45 days you have to make the revisions. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to wait 45 days. I mean, it. it I've it, tried to start already. Right. Because so. they're, if it's minor, it, it's kind of. It, well, the ex I, right now what I'm projecting is the expenditures are not going to change all that much going forward. We might have some additional, like the Common Core expenditures that will be added. But I believe most, and we'll look at other items that could be enhanced, but I believe like the staffing that we have going forward is adequate for next year. And then um, I didn't see anything about the money that's still owed to the districts. I, I know there's some. <laughs> No, sorry, when, he's, when they approve the LCFF, there's n no back money coming. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Stadler. Yeah, on uh, deficit spending for the, the next two years, seeing that we have an NTA, a CSEA, and we're going to have an out, you know, spending more money, we're still in line the third year to come even with that. I, I believe we will be very close to that goal, yes. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Let's, let's hope that we get lots of things from LCFF, right? <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, we're now coming to a public hearing. Um, the final budget adoption, uh, the Education Code 42127 requires the governing board of each school district to adopt a budget on or before July 1 of each year for the upcoming fiscal year. Is there anybody that would like to speak to that budget adoption? Do we have any requests? Ms. Thomas? All right, the public hearing is closed. Um, the next item is public comment on non-agenda items. Um, Tammy Lovato, is she here? Tammy Lovato, thank you. Thank you. Never done this before, so I don't know if it's the right time to do it or not. Well, introduce yourself, and, and uh, um, you've got three minutes. Three minutes? Three minutes. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm Tammy Lobato, and I've been in Newark Unified School District for 12 plus years at Lincoln. And I'm the office manager. Um, I've had the experience of working with eight principals. Yeah, eight. Um, the last one I've had the pleasure to work with is Pam Hughes for the last seven years. Um, Lincoln has experienced some trouble times, which some of you have experienced along with us. But um, we have preserve, persevered through the changes. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have dealt with changes and difficult times your own selves. Um, we are all in educational services for our children and educating our youth um, to achieve their best. Um, and consistency and love are two words I've heard a lot since I've become a parent 32 years ago and I still hear the importance of those two words and teachers comment on how important it is for kids to have consistency in their lives and for them to know they are loved. Um, we mentor our youth to be good examples and to teach them good in life, 
to deal with consequences, consequences mistakes, um, to learn from them. Um, Pam has brought that consistency to our school and the love to Lincoln. It's amazing to watch her. And um, I wish you all could see. In the morning, she greets all of our special ed students as they get off the bus, each by name. Um, her side door is always open. Kids freely come in to the office and um, greet her along with their parents. And they know the safety and love she has for each of them. Sorry, <laughs> so nervous. <laughs> um, a lot of our kids have difficulties in their lives and they just come to hang out so they're comfortable with her and they feel safe. Um, it's really important to know that your school's a safe place. Um, Pam knows 99% of our kids' names, first and last. Sorry. Um, transitional kindergarten starts in January, and she even knows those kids' names. And by the end of the year, everybody. Um, the parents really feel the same way about her as the children do. Um, they come by, they call, they know that the, her door's open all the time. And our staff is the same. It's an open door for her. She has a, a listening ear for all of us. Um, she loves the kids. <laughs> Pam is out there every recess and every lunch period. Um, she may be a little late on Thursdays for those long principal meetings, but she <laughs> always makes her presence out at the basketball game or tetherball or wall ball or hula hoop, whatever the kids are doing. Um, I understand being a team player. I have a family, and that's what we do is we pull together in tough times. But I believe just from hearing and knowing um, taking Miss Hughes away from our school will be a tragedy to our school. Um, what do we tell all the kids about safety and um, the love? I mean, she gives. It's just being taken away. Um, what are you going to tell them? Um, Lincoln School community is a wonderful place, and I'm honored to be part of it. Many of our transitional kindergarten parents from throughout the district comment on the family feel they have experienced at Lincoln School. Some of you in here have had the opportunity to have a child or a grandchild experience the love that Lincoln and Pam, our leader, has given us and to them. Um, it's too bad that we couldn't make a decision to have Miss Hughes be a mentor to our incoming principals at the four sites that are without principals at this time. And um, they could come visit our school as an example. Come meet with our parents that are a key part of making our school successful along with the staff. Um, I really and truly hope that you think about your decision that you make and how it'll hurt our school community and our family at Lincoln. Um, believe me, once this is heard by the families at Lincoln, if there's a change, um, be, be prepared. <laughs> You'll hear from a lot of people. Um, it's really sad to think that, um, I'm just going to say it, it's really sad to think that Bunker and Kennedy have always been the school that parents want their children to attend. And we're a school community. It should be felt that way throughout the district, not just two schools. And I believe me, I know, because it used to be like that when my kids attended school 15 years ago. So I know it's, it's still like that, and it shouldn't be like that. It should be across the board. Um, you know, being an office manager, I feel like I'm in public relations because when parents come in throughout the district for transitional kindergarten, I always encourage them to go to their home schools. You know, they want to stay. They love the family feeling of our school, and, I, and we encourage them to go to their home schools. You know, um, there's good and bad at all of our schools, and the diversity in our school community is different at all of them. But Lincoln has always been the smallest <coughs> school until recently. And it's given us the opportunity to have that family feel. And now Lincoln is thriving. And there may be a decision to take that away from us. And I just wanted to express that to all of you. Thank you. I think we got the message strong and clear that, that you think she's a wonderful principal. And we agree. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming and speaking to us. Okay. Thank you.
Um, Ms. Parks? Hi. Several months ago, I spoke to you um, regarding the, um, the minutes and uh, perhaps needing some assistance in the um, office because um, there's still some minutes from 2011 that are not approved. And as of like right now, you have two from May of this year that your board policy had said that you know you were going to be approving like tonight you would approve the previous minutes. So I just wanted to mention that again that apparently the 2011 ones are still there's some that have come forward, mm -hmm. but you still have some that are outstanding. You already have a board member that wasn't even here two years ago when the meeting took place. Mm -hmm. So um, perhaps something that when you're looking at the budget, there needs to be some additional help in that area. Thank you, Ms. Parks. Is there anybody else that would like to speak for non agendized items? Okay, we move on to consent agenda. Uh, the first group of consent items are personnel items. They're voted on as a block. The first item is personnel report, uh, the revised one. And the second one is a resolution um, to lay off classified employees. Um, does anybody have want to pull in any of these? Anyone from the audience? All right, can we have a motion? I move approval of A1 and A2. Ms. Thomas moves approval. Second. Mr. Stadler, second. Is there any discussion? I have. Um, I was going to pull the item, but instead what I'll do is, is um, use the area where um, we can comment can on at the, um, okay. at the end. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, would you vote, please? Did you get mine? No. There it goes. The vote is five to nothing passing items A1, A2. Did you want to speak? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, thank you. I, I would like to mention the um, changes for the next um, school year. Um, I, I, if I could paint just a little bit of a, of a history um, we had two retirements at Bunker and at Kennedy, and we put together a, an interview panel, and we got a series of uh, folks that were interested. Uh, we uh, paired those um, paper screening down to seven and interviewed um, the seven individuals. In the context of doing all of the uh, posting and allowing for this certain amount of time for people to apply, we had a couple other E events that took place. We had uh, Dr. Brown, which was also on the PLA, um, having an opportunity to go to um, uh, a fellowship for Teach for America in Washington, D.C., and asked for a leave of absence for one year. And um, the, board, uh, the board granted that. And then in the context of interviewing for the director position for Ed Services, uh, the person's name who moved forward was Debbie Ashmore. So late in the year, actually in June, we ended up with um, four openings. And what we decided to do, because we were already interviewing and have interviewed a pool of, of we felt, exceptional candidates, was to try to fit the personality and the style with the school. Um, and so what we've recommended and what the board has approved is uh, Debbie Ashmore, uh, Director of Curriculum and Instruction at the district office, Colleen, Colleen Fogarty, Principal of Bunker, Pam Hughes, the Principal of Kennedy, Katherine Waters, the Interim Principal at Music, Chris Wood, the Interim Principal at Milani, and Angela Ehrlich, the Principal of Lincoln. And I appreciate Tammy's um, statement and concerns, and it is a difficult piece. Pam should be at all eight of our schools, and then Nicole should be at the other eight, and Debbie should be at the other eight, <laughs> and Robin should be at the other eight, and, and all of those sorts of things. We, we do have phenomenal, and sometimes it's difficult to understand, well, why would you move a person? And so 
Uh, part of the issue and the answer to that is it, it is the district prerogative to do that, and, and this district has done it in the past. The other piece is it is an attempt to try to manage and balance talents and skill set and things that people bring to the table with a particular school. So it's um, never a perfect science, uh, but we spent um, quite a bit of time um, ranking all of the individuals and taking a look at, at the changes um, that we wanted to put in place. We believe this is the right move as we move forward. It's, it's a, a big change that typically takes place at the secondary level. If you take a look at the history of Newark Unified, um, the high school has had probably a dozen principals in 12 years. Um, the same could be said for McGregor, the same could be said off and on for the junior high, and I think interestingly now we've got a level of, of shift where some of the stability is there and some of the new folks, however we think, uh, just as our um, Pam and Debbie and Nicole were when they first started, many of them as first principals uh, developed to be phenomenal and are phenomenal leaders. Um, we think this is the right move at this time for Newark Unified School District. Change is difficult. Um, the elementary will experience some significant change, uh, but we believe we have some of the strength um, still there and with the new people. I think a, a new perspective for all of the people involved, and we're, you know, we're looking forward to good things, continued good things. Thank you. Uh, the next group of items that we'll be um, voting on are the non-personnel consent items. B1 is the warrant register. B2 is resolution for the final budge, budget adoption. B3 is agreement for professional services with Lozano Smith. B4, agreement for professional services with Dennis uh, Wallover and Kelly. B5, agreement for professional services with Dora Dome. B6, uh, the SPSA for Kennedy. B7, the SPSA for Schilling. B8, the SPSA for Newark Junior High. B9, the Education Protection Act Resolution Number 1920 and B10, minutes of the regular meeting of the Board of Education for June 4th. Um, does anybody want to pull any item? Anyone in the audience wants to pull to discuss an item? Then I will ask for a motion, please. Mr. Rodriguez moves that we accept. Mr. Stadler seconds. Uh, vote, please. The vote is five to zero. Thank you. On to new business. Oh, comments. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Comments. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, comments. Um, yeah. Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you, President Cracker. Um, it's very, very difficult um, to um, to ask a principal to move from a school um, that they've been at for a while. And since Ms. Hughes' name has been brought up, I, I mean, we go back a long ways when she was teaching over at Graham. Um, and it just fills my heart when I hear um, parents or employees at that particular site talk about what an impact um, that uh, that principals had on the school. Um, I'm pretty close to Lincoln, Mr. Foley, and I was on the interview team, and then when he passed away, and then since then, um, as we are to all the schools and all the principals that we have. Um, and I was assured by Dr. Markin that there was a conversation with Ms. Hughes, and um, um, the good soldier that she is um, decided to, uh, to approve that change for the betterment of the district as a whole. Um, on another note, um, Bunker and Kennedy were allowed to have input on their principal, and yet the other schools weren't. And um, this is something I hope the board in the near future will discuss. Um, there's nothing more important to a community, a school community, than the principal that runs that school. And to not have um, a say or input on who that principal is going to be is, is just, in my opinion, is something that we, we need to find a way to fix that. Um, 
the school community needs to have input. Um, and um, I trust Dr. Markin and, and the superintendent council and, and their, their thought process in making these decisions. Um, that's just my, my opinion on, on, uh, on having schools um, be involved in the decision-making process when you talk about staff and parents more than what we do now and we do have a process now I'm just hoping that that in the future we'll look at that and uh, and So people feel that that we're being inclusive instead of exclusive. Thank you Miss Thomas um, Yeah, I wanted to comment on the um, SIPSAs the single plan for student achievement um, Primarily what they seem to consist of is, is a budget and with broad, broad um, goals, you know, for each budget item, but, um, but not specifics. And I, I'm, I imagine this is not the place for specifics, um, but it, I hope there's specific plans behind these budgets and these, these goals for each. Uh, line item um, with with milestones and the person responsible and how it's going to be evaluated. Uh, I, I just think in the past and and maybe even continuing that um, some of the planning that that we that our, our schools do is um, not as specific as maybe it 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 could be. And you know this is a living document. It's not something that sits on the sh or should sit on the shelf. It, and um, I just hope there's a lot of, uh, I don't mean to imply there isn't, but I hope there's a lot of, of specific plans behind these. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? We now have employee organizations. Um, CSEA, Ms. Condon. Good evening, President Crocker, board, Dr. Markin, and staff. Um, I have to change my whole little speech today because I realized that something that was supposed to be on the agenda didn't make the agenda. So, but I did notice that what we have on the agenda is the um, resolution to lay off a few more classified members. And although we are have been approached on that, and I understand why I have a hard time understanding why we can't make things work with the fundings that we have in our district. And we managed to, the reason I say that is because we managed to find the money for other things, but we can't find the money to keep our people employed. So with that said, I wanna go on to saying that I'm very proud of my classified members because they are very sincere and they're very heartfelt and not just for each other or for themselves, but as you can see, for their principals and their staff and their students. And we go across the board with that. And, um, you know, some of the decisions that are made, I know we all make decisions and we all have to follow by what we're doing and we believe in what we believe but I've been in direct contact with some of the, for the best interests of the school district that haven't always quite worked out. And it saddens me, it really saddens me. But away from that, I wanna say that, um, Dr. Markin, you had mentioned, and uh, I don't remember whether it was a bulletin, but I saw a lot of the scholarships that were issued to the kids. And um, that's really exciting to see that. But nowhere was there mention that CSEA gave out two scholarships to two of our high school members. One, a Haley Jones, granddaughter of one of our classified members, Edna Jones, who is graduate, who is graduated from the high school, I guess, on Saturday. And she is going to CSU Long Beach to study her major in English. And then we had a Rika Joyce Crudo, hope I'm saying her name right. She's um, related to the Perla and Jose Perez in our food services. And she's going to San Jose State Interior Design. And they were both awarded with $500 scholarships from CSEI. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Just a quick comment. Yes, go ahead. Um, Ms. Condon, just yes. a quick comment. Um, tremendous, I just wanted to thank you and uh, CSA for the tremendous amount of work in the last couple of weeks as chairs went up, chairs went down, things were reconfigured for all the promotions, graduations, sometimes not much time, for example, between the junior high promotion and the high school graduation the next day, reconfiguring a million chairs and, you know, in the extraordinary amount of work. This was, you know, what, you know, when things go off well, people don't notice them, right? People only notice things when when they don't go well. Well, because things went so well, no one noticed how much work was involved. So, I mean, just from us, we all noticed it, and we all appreciate the amount of work that that um, uh, that your folks did, and to make to make the promotions and the graduations uh, such extraordinary events. And with that, I appreciate that because all we hear is the negative part. We are very skeleton crude across the school district, and we try real hard to do the best we can, and it seems like we constantly get attacked on what we're doing. We're trying our best to give you the quality you want, but it's real hard with the members' numbers being so down. So I appreciate that, and uh, hopefully our members will hear that too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. Is there anyone here from NTA? Anyone from NUMA? We move on to new business. Dr. Markin? Yes, thank you. Um, summary of donations. Um, we, we just wanted to mention that, that typically in the summary of donations, we don't put the scholarships. They're normally announced at the awards night, which they were for uh, Newark. Memorial High School, so uh, obviously thanks to CSEA, it wasn't an omission necessarily, but we don't, we didn't put a list of, of all of those scholarships here. These are the significant donations to different programs, but you know, obviously we appreciate um, um, all of CSEA's efforts, and you're right, every, we're all skeleton crews and we're working um, our tails off, and when you look at a lot of our facilities, there's, they've been without a lot of TLC in the last decade plus, so we've got a, a, big, a big road to hoe, so to speak. But if I could just highlight a few summary of some donations, um, maybe comment on a couple of them. We have $25 to the Rocketry Club, an anonymous employee, $100 to Graham Elementary from uh, board member Thomas, $125 to Graham Elementary from the Wells Fargo Foundation, the Educational Matching Gift Program, uh, $300.08 to Music Elementary as part of the Community Matching Gift Program, the donor there was PG&E, $500 for summer, the Summer 2013 Ash Street Program, Child Nutrition, the feeding program that goes on all summer from the Betterment Corporation, $1,500 to Graham Elementary from the Rotary Foundation, a $10,000 grant to Bridgepoint. Uh, the donor was Kaiser Permanente. They got a wellness grant that they uh, applied for. And the little one at the bottom, $139,000 uh, to Newark Unified School District Elementary Science Honors Program. It was a trust fund that had been established by Nicholas and Ruth Masterjohn, and Newark um, Unified School District was awarded 25% of 50% of the trust, which the initial donation is $139,000. Now they have in the trust earmarked that for elementary honor science programs and materials. So we are um, looking at what exactly that would look like in our elementary schools. There will be another um, donation, uh, a final donation of the trust. It will be um, smaller than that amount. Um, we're guesstimating maybe in the area of $50,000. Um, so it could be it, close to $200,000 from this trust and three other organizations Nonprofits were um, also awarded a uh, portion of the trust funds. So I just got that 
um, check and immediately brought it over to Elaine because that's way more than wow. I could deal with. So um, we'll be we'll be taking a look at at the parameters and bringing to the board through Ed Services what some of the things to to comply with the wishes of the trust. So um, all total, um, gosh, that's probably one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in donations and so we're very excited about uh, the interest um, that has taken place over the last a little while in Newark Unified with the foundation and grants and Cargill and and all of these uh, entities Chevron um, so we're very very pleased at, at the momentum Great, Rotary. Rotary, right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, the next item no, is the, no, no. We I'm have sorry. To prove it. Any comments? We I have to prove it too. That's okay. true. Anybody, does anybody have any comments? No. Okay, let's go ahead and move. Mr. Stadler, do you move that we accept it? Mm -hmm. Who would like to second? I'll second that. Ms. Thomas, second. Uh, vote, please. Five to zero in favor of accepting $150,000. Good. We want to make sure we accept it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the next item is the board contracting policy for Measure G. Dr. Markham. If I could add, let me, I have been in um, verbal and written contact with the trust fund and have expressed the district's appreciation and, and all of those things. So there, there have been some forms that Elaine has had to fill out and those sorts of things. Great. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, you want to do number B? Okay. Uh, several meetings ago, we had a workshop with Vanner Construction on the Measure, measure G, and we were uh, discussing the um, a way to not simplify, but kind of speed up our um, purchasing power for. Uh, the different, organi uh, the different vendors that we would use. And before you is a recommendation that some of the, uh, how we would approach a bid where a certain dollar value, we could um, get three quotes and come in if it's under 200,000 or under 20,000, which is what we currently have in place what we are asking here is for the Measure G projects only, that uh, that bid limit be raised uh, to 83,400 that we could do internally and then advise you on, because you would have already agreed to the projects and that we would only go out for a formal bid for anything over the 83,400. Does, um, do you have any questions? Any question, Ms. Thomas? Um, yeah, I guess, what does it mean, um, including materials and services, and then it says semicolon services only on page 13 of 28? And, and what, is, what is services? I know that, you know, even under 20,000, we, if it, if well, it's services. Well, a if lot of the... Uh, purchasing agreements you will or when we go out to bid you'll have an equipment price and then a labor cost and there's a lot of times that we can go out and purchase equipment easier and then go out to bid for the labor portion of it or if it's small enough we can add it together where both the equipment so it's more based on the dollar amount than it is on the services and Okay. supplies and um this then by approving this for measure g we're not changing our policy so for anything outside of measure g we still will bring everything <laughs> it in would, right and when measure g is over this goes away this goes away and is there any con i mean did did um lozano look at this and make sure that this remember because he he approves all or looks at all of the contracts, and you, I would think that this is this is a pretty big departure from. We had a discussion with them. Um, I didn't formally send this to him, but we did have a discussion, and he didn't have any problem with it. Okay. 
Uh, might I ask specifically what are we passing the whole packet that you gave us or is it just a statement, a policy statement? Uh, the, it's basically a policy statement, but we're using this pro management program as the backup to that policy change. Okay, so when we vote on an item, then we would have to have, I, I feel uncomfortable doing 28 pages worth of voting and accepting if what we're talking about is just allowing you to, without board approval, to authorize payments. Um, under $83,400. Basically, that's... Basically, that's, payments for things right, that yeah. we had talked about. Right. So how would we word that as something that we could vote on? Could we could we bring the policy to, to the board saying for Measure G to sunset when Measure G is over that this... I, I can bring it back to say that, yeah, yes. I think it would be better if mm -hmm. it's in the policy yeah, rather yeah, than absolutely. buried in a document absolutely. like this. Okay. I, I can bring it back at our next meeting. We're going to be meeting to do next that. week, next Tuesday, so that might be... A, I, I can get okay. that done. Does anybody else have any questions about um, policy? The, the, the program management plan is it's pretty well written and pretty thorough. Um, so is there any reason why we can't pass that now and then, and then have this other policy change? Um, it's up to the board discretion. Okay. I, I read... Um, Nielsen's summary and kind of broke it down pretty well, so um, I'm okay with voting under that. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with it too. As long as you, as well, long it, it seems to me that what we'd be doing is accepting their management their management plan, mm -hmm. which is it, all these pages, <laughs> and you know when really all we care about is that one little slice that we could memorialize in our policy and then have it sunset yeah. so they never we never I can have bring to, it I can bring it back next week we no can problem. do both we can. Right, could do both you can approve the plan and then I can bring back the actual okay. policy would you like to approve the plan or, or sure. would you sure. like to wait for that I'll move to approve. okay Mr. Sadler moves for approving the plan, sure. plan Mr. Rodriguez seconds any other questions or comments let's vote please vote is five to nothing. Hopefully and then, the policy when it comes back is not 28 pages. <laughs> <laughs> 28 words. 28 words. That will do it. Okay. Well, if I could just remind the board, part of our work study session there, again, we was brought to light the urgency of need mm -hmm. and yet the also enormity of yeah. need, meaning that two to three years, three years ago now, actually before my arrival, we had a $150 million um, estimate of if we were to be able to do everything and we're sitting thankfully with $63 million, right. but that will create and cause some difficult decisions that we knew all along we would need to make. And now as it starts to take form, now it becomes that reality of something that we've known for two or three years, um, that the, the uh, needs are enormous, but had we not had this $63 million, I'm not sure what state our schools and our classrooms and our roofs and our, and our systems would be. Uh, with just some of the things we've done over the last couple of years in terms of getting the heating and the units and the, the, some of those systems in place, um, one can only imagine. So, you know, it's one of those kind of bittersweet things that we we have that we wish we had 150 because we could do absolutely everything but we these will be those difficult decisions so thank you we wish we had 500 because <laughs> we could do more right absolutely absolutely um i didn't see under new business is comprehensive safety plan yes. dr markin yes thank you very much um president crocker and board um Upon our arrival here a couple of years ago, and we began to we began to look at uh, safety plans. Uh, we began to look at food sources and things. And as a continual number of crises occurred across our country, everything from Newtown to San Diego to you name it, um, unbelievable um, issues. Uh, we it was clear that we were out of compliance in some areas and uh, we needed to minimally get to compliance and maximally prepare 
our students and our staff, um, our district administration in the event of um, some kind of catastrophe uh, taking place in our community, at our school, uh, wherever the case may be. And uh, we had in our midst Mr. John Warren, a uh, retired captain from uh, San Mateo, battalion chief from San Mateo, who uh, this is actually uh, not only up his alley, but this is what he does and has participated in relief programs with all of the major disasters over the last probably five to ten years. So I've been in conversation with John and asked him to put together a tiered proposal for our board to get us into compliance so that we have a, a common um, working relationship with fire, police, disaster, and we have um, our, for the lack of better term, ducks in a row because we are not and have not been in compliance. And so we're very excited about uh, this plan. It's an extensive plan and I've asked John to be here tonight to kind of break it down into a couple components for the board, field any questions that, that you may have, and um, we're seeking uh, potentially board approval of uh, this plan this evening. So, Mr. Warren, thank you and welcome. Well, thank you. And um, for the board, you need to recognize Dr. Markin's concern. I have heard people coming up, I, because of my association with his assistant, I watch a lot of the board meetings. You have a community that does care, really interested in the safety of the schools, the security of the schools, and for me to be able to participate with all of you to ramp that up one more notch is really kind of a privilege. After career giving to a community, uh, to be able to continue that is meaningful to me and hopefully it'll make a big difference for the school district. Um, I'm a retired battalion chief, operational battalion chief from San Mateo Fire. Retired several years ago, but I still retain uh, positions as safety officer for California Task Force 3, uh, FEMA-sponsored urban search and rescue team. As Dr. Markin said, I've been to the Oklahoma bombing, I've supported the World Trade Center, I've been to Hurricane Katrina, wildfires, the list goes on. Um, I have done some plans for other agencies, other fire departments. I currently work for the coroner's office. Um, you know what? You may not ever have a disaster. But I sure know one when I see one, <laughs> and there will be one. And if nothing else, what this plan does is get everybody on the right page to speak the right language, to have the ideas in the back of their mind. And I know, looking at all of you, that you have been sleeping well since you got your copy on June 6th. Because I know, before you put your head on the pillow and rapidly We've passed out reading this, you've been learning probably quite a bit. As you know, in the late 1990s, the state had faced several tragedies, and as a result, the school districts were required by law to implement SB 187, which was a school safety plan. After the Oakland Hills fires, every public agency in the state of California was required to, one, make their people available as disaster service workers, and two, uh, comply with standardizing emergency management system requirements, SEMS. Now there's two, two good reasons to do that. First off is, like, like Dr. Markin and I have both said, you need to understand the system in which you're going to be working in an emergency. You need to be able to speak the same language. And you all need to understand, everybody needs to understand their role when working with other agencies. Because you're not going to be alone but the efficiency of how well things get done is being able to speak in their, their languages. The other big thing is, is if you don't have a SEMS emergency plan in place and you don't follow it, all the monies that will come to you from state and federal governments later won't be available to you. And that was the one hook that requires all of you to follow the, the SEMS plan and have the SB 187 plan in place. And that hook is that the government will not reimburse you any costs unless you have played by the rules that were established. So it's not so much whether you do or don't 
need or want the plan. It's that you're required by law to have it, and it is in your interest to embrace it. Now, in talking with Dr. Markin, we had set up a, a tiered system that, one, would bring you into compliance. You've got about 400 pages of compliance. That box is checked, short of filling in a few annexes with telephone names and numbers and a few forms that will be dependent upon the new school year. The other part of this tier was, it's great to have a big document that gathers dust. <laughs> But the real point is to come up with something that's usable in the emergency and at least give everybody a little knowledge on which to work with before a disaster happens. Because when it happens isn't the time to learn. Given that, we've already started some training with the principals and the staff here at the district with some of the basics of the expectations of the plan. And that will be continuing on with the back to school activities and meetings uh, before the start of the 2013-2014 year. That continues on throughout the year with the staff meetings at the school sites where we'll have blocks of time at every one of those meetings every month to go over scenarios, situations that may occur, how they would be expected to react, and really reinforcing the third section of this manual which is the response section in which we tried to come up with everything we could imagine that could happen at a school site and give them the basic checklist to get them started on how to deal with that emergency, who to call, what actions to take. And there's 34 scenarios outlined. Um, this manual is a good review. It's a good place to go to for extra material. It can be used within the district and within the school sites as a lesson plan. But what will evolve out of this in the next 30 to 45 days is what I, what I would call a go kit. And in it is a very abbreviated version. It will give the principal, who will be the incident commander of an incident or, or an emergency that's taking place, the basic guidance of what's expected, what they need to do. And within the school itself, whether the different teams made up of the staff that will respond to emergency, whether it's the first aid team, the search team, the utilities team, the team that will reunite parents and children. It'll give them the checklists they need that don't really currently exist to guide their actions. If you read nothing else, there's four sections in the manual. Preparation mitigation, preparedness mitigation, there's planning, there's response, and then there's the after action, how to get ourselves back on board, start working with FEMA, with the state, to get everything back to a new normal. That response section is what really drives this whole plan, once the educational piece is done. During the summer, all the schools will be inventory for their classroom disaster supplies, for the sites that have disaster caches, they'll be inventoried, lists will be prepared of what needs to be replaced. Um, I think that pretty much outlines three tiers. We're getting ourselves into uh, compliance, bringing ourselves into preparedness, and then having supplies necessary to keep staff and children safe and secure for several to multiple days or until another agency can be brought in to assist with that. In a nutshell, that's it. But I want to address any questions you have because it's your ink that's going to be on the paper. Uh, Mr. Stadley. John, thank you so much for all your time doing this. Um, this is way, way, way overdue. It's not if it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's when it's going to happen. And some of these schools, when it happens, they're not going to be, 911 is not going to work. There, there's not going to be a response team there immediately. The apparatus might be in the apparatus bay with the roof sitting on it. Um, these sites need to know what to do because they could be by themselves for quite a while. And I just want to thank you for doing this. This is, this is way overdue, and thank you. Uh, 
Um, Mr. Rodriguez. Good evening. Thank you for um, taking the time to bring us up to par in, um, with the safety issue at the schools. Um, the question that I had is um, a, lot, a lot of time and effort is, is being put or has been put for years by the site principal and, and the staff in making sure that each one of their schools is safe, um, you know, to keep intruders out. And uh, so each school has probably their own way of doing things. So as you um, visit the different schools, um, is it going to be your recommendation that we try to have uniformity and, and try to see if we do, the, or are you going to just add to basically what they're doing and improve the safety plans that they already have? Are you speaking to security as sort of the legal security or the broad sense? No, the broad security? sense. Broad sense. For the most part, we want to standardize it throughout the district <coughs> because under the incident command system, everything starts with the person able to do as much as they can on their own. So if an incident is happening in a school and can be addressed and satisfied at the, at the school level, it should stay there and it should be fairly consistent. If the school needs assistance, the district office becomes involved and if it is going to be multiple schools, multiple issues, they're going to have to open up an emergency operations center and start assisting multiple locations. So the plan really falls on consistency. Now, every school being an entity unto itself, there will be site-specific things that they will want to do, and that's fair game. But as far as the model, it will be consistent across all the different campuses. But agreed, you know, and I have to agree with you, and I can sort of see where you're going is, the high school is a different animal from an elementary school. And somewhere in the middle comes the junior high. The process is the same everywhere. It's the same process the fire department uses, law enforcement uses. The process works. California invented the process and it was adopted by the United States and it is used worldwide. And it doesn't matter what discipline you're in process itself is consistent and it works. How you utilize it is up to you, but the basic components need to be the same across the board. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Menziger. Uh, thank you, John. I, actually, you, when you mentioned uh, you, this wasn't drafted to gather dust, it was the exact phrase I was going to use, you know. How do we make sure that this doesn't get put on the shelf to gather dust, like playbooks and, and Bibles and such that you read once and that's it? Um, is there a training, do you have a training plan that goes with this, a recommended training plan that goes with this? Obviously, we have to adopt it, but... There, uh, there is a training plan. And like, as I had stated, it has already started with the principals in the principals' meetings, getting familiar with ICS and the different positions they have their homework over the summer is with their staff understanding what these different positions are and then assigning names to them. Okay, but what about the, the, so for example, in a lockout situation or lockdown situation, the teacher in the classroom. Um, uh, are you proposing uh, training so that teacher understands exactly what's expected of, the, of her? Yes. And okay. what, what will be happening is the two meetings, Dr. Martin, in August, one is the back to school. And the management retreat. And the management retreat. Those will become the overall training opportunities. The one thing I'm learning is I don't know if you give enough credit to your, your staff. When I go through, this has been a learning experience. Uh, experience for me seeing what the Board of Education cranks out and these people are expected to know. Mm. This is one that, you know, the emergency plan is one that I would hope to get some very firm seeds planted in August. Here's what the plan is, here's how the concepts of the plan work, 
Here's what the different positions do. Here's section four, three. Here is what a go kit looks like. This is what you're going to, when something happens, this is what you're going to refer to. Lockdown. Principal will declare it's a lockdown, put it out over the PA. Everybody will take the appropriate actions based on their go kit guide to ensure the safety of the students. And yes, everybody at every level in the organization will have the tool at their disposal to know what to do. That will be followed up throughout the school year, every school every month, to run through additional education and go through scenarios. Let's do a tabletop exercise. And then, if all is running smoothly, by the end of the school year, we'll have a district-wide a, a district drill that will cause the Emergency Operations Center to open up, communicate with multiple school sites. They can have their emergencies and deal with them, be overwhelmed if necessary, have to coordinate through the assistance of the district office and the Emergency Operations Center, and we'll test and see if it worked. If it works, I am the greatest. <laughs> if it doesn't, that's good too. Because yeah, we we've, ad we've identified the weak points yeah. and now we know where to go. And then yeah. it's up to the district as to how they want to carry that forward. But the seeds will be planted, the groundwork laid, whatever nomenclature you want to add to it. Well, the, the, oh, and I was just going to say, uh, Member Mensinger, the other piece that's kind of going to be running parallel is we're, we're talking a lot about the sites and the classrooms and the schools, and, and uh, that's obvious, but we also have, we have uh, child nutrition, child care, MOT, district office. We have a lot of other entities that, that will be a parallel track next year that may have a little more flexibility because the teachers have certain times where they've got 25 to 30 some odd students. So there, there's going to be kind of dual tracks going uh, because everyone will have a part and everyone will have a role to play. I just didn't want to miss that piece. No, of no I appreciate that. You know, I, um, as we know, every time you do one of these type of drills and you do the training, you do the drills, we learn something. It could be 10 years down the road and we're going to do. And I guess my point is, and my point is that it's very good to go through this the first time, but we need to continue this. We can't just go through this once and say, okay, we know this, great, and move on. And because, you know, chances of a disaster really aren't very good, but when they happen, you need to be. to the choir. And well, and, <laughs> yes, and, but I, I want to make sure that, that we're understanding. I know you understand this, but I want to make sure we also understand this, too, that, that we had this, this needs to be ongoing training and a recurring training, and every year we do it. Um, just a couple other just real quick questions. Um, uh, is it the intent to post this on the website or post this in a place where uh, not only you know the families know or in the event something happens, anybody can find out what the information is, but also we can look this up, teachers can look this up in the event of an issue, or um, how does that? I mean, what are we going to do with the book, the playbook? Uh, are they going to have an opera? Everybody going to be issued a copy and they have to bring it to school with them every day? or well, Hard copy in every, in every, dis, every school and district offices in several okay. locations. We have discussed putting it on the website. Um, There's pros and cons to that. You know what? I wear a fire badge or wear a cop badge. Depends what day of the week it is. Yeah, it should be there for everybody. No, you don't want to tell everybody all the plays. <laughs> yeah. So there's... There will be a balance. I, I believe that the bulk of the manual, public document, has to be available to the public. There's no harm in putting it to the website. Um, I mean, we could make it available at the district office. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants to do it. Yeah, um, but but at, least, at the very least, you know, I'd like to see you know maybe in every classroom, and that way, if you know something happens, that somebody isn't everybody isn't calling to the uh, uh, front office going. Now, what was this section on? Uh, you know. Um, Two real quick things. The communication section, brilliant. One of the issues we had when we had our lockdown, we had a number of issues when we, when we went through our lockdown a few years ago, the communication piece of it. Um, there wasn't a lot of communication coming out to the classrooms to, so they know what to do. Everybody was on the cell phone. I was sitting in National Stadium in Washington, D.C., watching a baseball game, getting phone calls from kids in classrooms. 
So, I mean, I, you know, having a good communication plan is essential, and, and you know, having somebody of authority being able to uh, review that. Terminology, uh, our valedictorian was sharing a story about uh, terminology, how the SWAT team came in and asked a question, and the way they asked the question, the teacher answered the question, and they all turned the guns on our valid Victorian. Again, terminology, understanding things. So that's, again, that, that is brilliant. But um, I really appreciate the detail that went into this and, and looking through this. It's not perfect. We can't say it is because we'll find out. But then we'll add to it, and then we'll make it better. But it's certainly a lot better than we have. And I can't thank you enough for the work that you did and involving every, getting everybody involved to make sure that this is right. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Yeah, thank you very much. This is a fantastic document. Um, my question relates to how it, it augments, dovetails, supplements, replaces um, the stuff that's in our employee handbook. You know, there's like about 10 pages of checklists, safety checklists that employees are expected to, to be using. Um, is is there is there any um, is there any congruence there? There will have to be. Um, if I'm trying to think of what the checklists are, if they're district policy checklists, those types of things would remain in effect. Anything that would be uh, superseded by this plan would have to be changed out in those because you want it consistent everywhere. You, you bring mm -hmm. a very valid point. I'll look into that. I have not reviewed the uh, employee handbook. For that. Good. Um, I, I'm delighted that we're doing this. Um, having gone through lockdowns and and got caught in situations, I look at it from the the person that is with the children uh, situation, and you need to have something that will help them know what to do when they're not thinking straight. Uh, something that goes in their notebook or their their rule book or whatever it might be that says, you know, a, a cheat list, you know, the cliff notes, so that you can go through and do it. I love the, the fact that you're talking about the grab and go things. I think this, this makes it really practical. The other piece is, is that I've seen a lot of these things come and go. I taught for 20 years. And so I, it needs to be something that becomes part of the culture. If there's a problem, the school is going to be the place where the community's going to have to go uh, if there's a hurricane or tornado or whatever it might be. And so the people at the schools are the first, you know, they're deputized. They they're become people that are in charge of things. And so we need to know what our responsibilities are, but yet have reminders that are easily available for the quick study. Because you talk about it six months ago, looks good to me. And then you proceed to go everything else between that, and so there's you need to have something there to to help you make the right decisions. Well, and the whole goal is, like you're saying, two of your schools are designated by the county and the city as shelters. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in reality, could they're all. Oh, that's right. <laughs> you, know, you don't know which one's going to be destroyed. But yeah. But again, two of them we know are actually designated and planned for that use. You say you know. I didn't know that. Which one? Well, you just said that. Yeah. That's because I don't live in Newark. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you've had me studying a lot. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but the whole essence of the, the grab and go kit is to have, you know, I talked about planting the seed. I know you've all taken a first aid class. You won't remember everything the book says. But you know when someone's bleeding what to do. It's become instinctive. You know, you may not have all the details of CPR, but you know you're supposed to be doing something, and something's better than nothing. Yeah. The manual's great. Just remember, planting the seed, the go kit's where you're going to go. You can open it up to the type of emergency you have. And there's my playlist. And that'll get me started, and I'll get me started right. And from that, I got something to build on. And that's, and that's what that's about. What are, we, what are we talking about in terms of food? Are we talking about food stockpiling as part of this? That is something the district needs to consider. Right now, I mean, is it a recommendation? In the best of all possible worlds, yes. 
Uh, many of the schools right now have some disaster lockers or, or caches. Mm -hmm. um, they, I will find out exactly how much they are in need of updating. But that's something that staff will have to consider as to how far they want to go. Um, you know, it's great to have water. Water's cheap. That's, that's easy. Foods or anything you put in there are disposable items. You don't use them. It hits a date where you're going to throw it away. So it has to be an ongoing financial right. line item. They had, I think we had, didn't we have storage? Like uh, the dumpster things? And the kids would buy a three-day supply. Had them in storage. And they would get them at the end of the year. They would take them home with them. I'm not sure they're still doing that or not, are they? The problem is in the lockdown, they had no food. They had no bathroom. I mean, yeah. they had people going over garbage cans. <coughs> Well, and, and one of the things that we'll address over the summer is, you know, in the, in the major disaster, you've got these giant sea land containers that have been right, filled with, right, um, right. they've been started. And <coughs> it's how far you want to go with that. You know, you'll have the basics to get you started in there, but you know, do we want water for one day, two days, ten days? Do we want food? What's that food going to look like? How long does it take? But that's got to be worked out kind of over the summer, and then a financial picture painted as to how you're going to get there. The classrooms, they need to be addressed. And I know some schools have better kits than other kits in each classroom. You know, and, and heaven forbid you get to that point where we're going to keep kids locked into a classroom for long periods of time. You know, it may never happen. But the one day it does, you right. want to have the bare right. minimums right. there. You want to be prepared. I was in a situation where there's something like 50 kids in one small little classroom because it was lunchtime, and we just stuffed the kids into rooms to get them away from a possible person that was had a gun, a gun that he was going through. So, I mean, it's, it's you can't you can't plan for all eventualities, and you're just going to have to survive. But you're going to have to survive. Um, but definitely stop. Mr. Rodriguez. No, just a little tidbit. Not that you don't know this already, but um, occasionally parents might, you know, either come to you if, if you're on site or, um, or go to the principal and ask what they can do at their home to make sure that they're prepared for the disaster. And insurance companies for years have offered um, you know, um, either classes or brochures or, and then free of charge for anybody that wants it. And um, <coughs> so anybody that has a homeowner's policy can call their agent and, and get that information for free on what to do in their, in their home to make sure that they're prepared for an emergency. You know, oftentimes too, and it's something you may want to look into, um, insurance companies sponsor other agencies, school districts, and they will contribute towards disaster preparedness and things that meet their interests because their interest is in saving a dollar while being able to say we're helping the community. There may be some tie-ins there too. Mm -hmm. You just put me in the spot. Um, yeah. Dr. Markham, <laughs> is, there, is there a cost? It, it talks about community the district's resources. What kind of cost are we talking about? And is this something that's in our budget? Uh, yes, Tier 1 we brought to the board. It has been budgeted. As we, as we said, the first one is the initial evaluation and getting mm -hmm. up to compliance, mm -hmm. which we, we have got right. to do. We are putting together a proposal to move into Tier 3 after the analysis comes back this summer. And then we will bring that to the board in the fall in terms of now, we'll also have a, probably a little better handle on, on the funding mechanism from the state and at what level now does the board want to go. Um, so we, that's why we kind of broke it down in those, in those tiers. So we're voting then on? To approve the, the plan. The plan, correct, which okay. will put us in compliance with the state. Good. Any, any other questions or comments? I'll make a motion. Mr. Stadler, we'd like to move that we accept Second. the comprehensive plan. Okay, Mr. Bensinger, seconds. Any other questions or comments? Let's vote, please. The vote is five to zero. Very good. Well done. Thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. 
Uh, we are going to come back for student expulsions after we have. Do you want to go off now, or should we go ahead and um, do the board committee reports? Can we do our committee reports? Yeah. Okay, we'll okay. we'll jump ahead to the board uh, committee reports. Uh, Mr. Stadler, do you have anything that you'd like to? Yes, I. Uh, this is the first year I've been on the board, and I want to say what a pleasure and an honor it was to be at these graduations and these promotions. This truly makes everything that we do all year long worthwhile. Um, seeing some of those high school students that I had on my t-ball team, being able to be the last handshake that they had going off of that stage, <clears throat> words can't express it. So it was, it was an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez. Yeah, um, I think we ended up having a hugging contest at the... Uh, <laughs> 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 um, it's, it is great. And um, as I shared with all of you, it's, it's the fun part of what we do. And, and, uh, and Dr. Markin already alluded to it, that we were basically almost at every promotion or graduation. And it's, it shows how the board feels about the students that we uh, make decisions for. Um, I just wanted to, on the reports, um, um, on the Avanzando reports, that um, the Avanzando awards, that Dr. Markin was named the administrator of the year, which was, and then they also awarded each school with, and kids with different students with scholarships and awards. And that was great. And uh, um, the um, SELPA, um, we did meet, and um, basically, like um, Mrs. Nielsen said, we discussed the budget, and uh, we're waiting on Governor Brown to, uh, to sign it <coughs> so we can move on. So, um, and, um, and I know RP is the same way, um, and I know Member Thomas might report on that. Um, on the request, I had talked to Mr. Winton, and um, um, I think most of you know that I was in the middle of bringing the Community Day School to Newark with Superintendent Shear years ago, and um, at the time, the you know we were going to make money, and Mr. Hamahashi was the principal, and, and it went pretty well. But at some point, we were losing money. We were only serving our kids, and I did ask Dr. Markin when he first came on to to look at the possibility of maybe partnering with Fremont and, yeah. and uh, Union City the way we do with the South and the RP. And Mr. Witten has some excellent information, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, he can share that with, with the whole board. Um, and, um, and I just want to thank Dr. Markin for continuing that conversation. Um, um, I don't like sending our kids to Hayward Community today. I, and if we can find a way that we can make money to keep the kids in our area, I think would be a great way to go. So I, I thank Mr. Winton and Dr. Markin for continuing that conversation, and uh, I think it'll be a win-win for us and uh, enable enable us to keep our kids here. Okay, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Yeah, I'd like to um, acknowledge and thank staff for the great job they did in in um, advertising to the board all the opportunities for us to attend and. Uh, setting up those uh, windows and staff setting up the windows so we could attend as many <coughs> promotion ceremonies and graduations as we did. And they were all just exciting to be at. Um, and ROP, there's a meeting in two days. I'll be attending <coughs> that. And um, as you know, we have a new superintendent. Um, the Kennedy principal is now going to be the ROP superintendent, the Fremont Kennedy principal. Um, Mr. Hansen, what's his first name? I forgot. <laughs> oh, anyway, I think he's a great choice. I'm really looking forward to that, and we'll be um, we'll be uh, talking about uh, since Fremont settled uh, with their employees. We'll be talking about a settlement for the ROP employees at uh, Thursday's meeting, and uh, yeah, everything going at ROP is up and to the right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mensinger. Yes, um, uh, again, 
and thank you all too for uh, attending all the various events we had. It was a, uh, it's always the best part of the, the school year for us. Uh, I did want to mention something. Um, I would like, uh, if, if the board is, uh, is agreeable to this, I'd like to um, ask staff to write a letter to, of thanks to the Arby's uh, restaurant. Um, uh, as you recall, a, a couple of weeks ago, the buses coming back from grad night, one of them broke down. And uh, the rest of the buses came, but one bus, the one broken down uh, bus was left behind with some students and we had two fantastic classified members uh, that were watching over the kids uh, there and everything was great everything was safe and and as MOT was uh, scurrying with a vendor to get um, to get help down to them and, and everybody did their job well buses break down we all know that but um, Arby's uh, Fed our kids, in many cases, I believe, gave free food to our kids, took care of them. Wow. And, um, and again, we had two classified people there. There were, there were no certificated people there, but the classified people were there. And they, they watched over the kids. And it was, you know, you know, they made a sort of bad thing into a good thing. Because the kids had fun. Everyone was taken care of. And then, like I said, this Arby's restaurant stepped up to do something very, very nice for our kids. And if we can maybe show our appreciation with a letter to them or some acknowledgement, even a you know a resolution from the board, anything we can do to sure. to show. Um, I would even I would even suggest for the two classified employees that all of a sudden their job duties changed rather dramatically <laughs> um, to uh, send that uh, thanks to them as well. And the Arby's, I'd be, we'd be more than happy to do that. That was Arby's at Love's Truck Stop, and they not only gave them one meal. They kept filling up their sodas. They brought them extra burgers all day long. Wow. They didn't let our kids. So, and that was great because the, the, yeah, that's amazing. And, and, and you know, at a time when there's no buses anywhere because everybody's you know renting buses, you know, the the company went all out to get it. So everybody was doing their job, but you know, it's just nice when people yeah, step up. Yeah, absolutely. Let I, let me get that straight. Uh, Member Sadler, there is a place called Love's Truck Stop. Love's truck, truck Stop. Okay. Yes. Our, <laughs> what, what, what now, city what are you it? saying? <laughs> <laughs> Bakersfield? Yes. Perfect. There you go. Because we need an expert in the house, and we've got one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's in Hills. Thank you. Um, I have uh, just one request, and that is mm -hmm. the board think about, we have a board evaluation. So when we're, we're talking next week, think about when it would be a good time this summer to get that taken care of. And then I think we need to start doing some governance as a governance group to get together. And I know that this is not the time right now, but if we have a chance to sit back and think about how we're doing our job and what we might do to be better at what we're doing. Um, we can take care of that. So if you think about the summer, I think the other thing is that, that I know that there are times that I have forgotten to tell Liz that I'm going to be out of town. So I think it's probably wise that we all sort of make sure she knows where we are in case they have to get a hold of her. I was in China one year when they had a special meeting. For some reason, they didn't ask me to come. <laughs> and we did not even do a phone on that one. So um, I think that even though we are going places in the summer, we still have they need to be able to connect with us. So that's good. So I would like to go now to um, closed session, and then we will come back and we will uh, go ahead and do it. You will report up from the expulsions. We will report up from the expulsions for that. Okay. Thank so you. let's go and, you, and talk about. Do it. You don't adjourn. You just. Adjourn to closed session. We adjourn to closed session. <laughs> adjourn to closed session. And then we will come back. Right. So.